Good morning. It's my great pleasure to introduce the speaker for today. I think uh, many of you, if not all of you, know uh, David very well. Uh, he has rescued us from many tough situations where people have uh, complex problems in their lung, they're bleeding, they have tumors, etc. David has been our go-to person, uh, our interventional pulmonologist who always comes to our rescue. David did his uh, training in Boston, then he came here for fellowship and then went back to Boston for uh, an additional training in interventional pulmonology and he has been here for most of his uh, professional career. Uh, again, it's a great pleasure to have him here today to talk to us about management of air airway obstruction. Thank you, David. Thank you, Basil. Can everyone hear me in the back? That's good. Well, good morning. Um, as uh, uh, Dr. O'Reilly has mentioned, I um, know many of you, and for those of you who I haven't met, um, my name is David Berkowitz. I, I do interventional pulmonary for about the last eight years or so here. Um, interventional pulmonary um, is, as Dr. O'Reilly mentioned, kind of a emergency situation a lot of times for some of the patients who are um, acutely ill from airway obstruction, which is something that um, I know you guys refer over to us very quickly and we do our best to get them in usually within 24 hours. Um, I promise you I'm not like this NASCAR uh, sponsored physician that has anything uh, financially related to discussion today. Um, so just kind of a br brief overview of what we'll be talking about for next hour or so. We're going to describe malignant airway obstruction and how to identify those patients. Look at some of the techniques involved when you refer patients over, kind of what we do um, when they come by and see us and the surgical and, and endoscopic techniques that are available. And then along the way, we'll sprinkle it in with uh, a few patients that some of you may have um, referred to us um, over the last couple of years. So to start off by defining malignant airway obstruction, this is tumor um, or metastasis in and around the airway. So either an intrinsic obstruction, so tumor within the airway, or something pressing on the airway, an extrinsic compression. And when we look at it, we divide it into three categories, and this will influence kind of how it's managed. So you have the endoluminal disease, so tumor that's confined within the airway lumen itself. You have extrinsic compression, so like a, a large lymph node or a bulky mass, which hasn't eroded into the airway yet, but causing compression on it. And then the most common type, was, which is the mixed obstruction, which has a little component of both. So there's narrowing from the outside, as well as tumor within inside the airway. So there are about uh, 80,000 cases of malignant airway obstruction diagnosed per year in the United States. As you can imagine, lung cancer is going to be the most common cause of malignant airway obstruction. But as we'll see in a minute, any cancer um, can metastasize in and around the airway and cause airway problems. Um, as most people are familiar with in this room, there are greater than 200,000 uh, cases of lung cancer diagnosed annually in the United States. Up to a third of those patients will actually have um, uh, endoluminal disease. So they'll have some sort of cancer which is eroding into the airway, um, just as an example. And we'll see many pictures like this throughout uh, the next uh, hour or so. Um, but what's most important is identifying these patients early because about a third of them will have uh, mortality related to the complications of uh, airway obstruction. Um, so again, uh, lung cancer is the most common cause of malignant airway obstruction. Um, but anything in and around the uh, airway itself can lead to problems with uh, compromising the airway. So esophageal cancers, thyroid malignancies, um, goiters can fall into this category as well, but that's usually more of a, um, a, an easier problem to fix with debulking from the outside. Uh, lymphoma we see a lot, which, which um, uh, will cause a lot of uh, obstruction more of the uh, proximal airway, which can be a problem with initial presentation. Um, and then there are primary tumors of the airway, the most common being carcinoid tumors, but there are some more uh, rare cancers that don't respond to systemic therapy or radiation therapy as well, the mucoepidermoid cancers, adenoid cystics, that um, w uh, patients rely heavily on us for debulking and local therapy to open up the airways. And then metastases from uh, really any sort of cancer, the most common we're seeing are melanomas, renal cells, um, and breast cancers. <clears throat> 
So patients present with a variety of symptoms. Cough, shortness of breath are going to be the most common. A lot of patients present with hemoptysis. Um, if the obstruction is more in the trachea and the more proximal airway, you uh, notice symptoms of strider. But that's only after you get to a point where the airway is typically five millimeters or less. So a lot of patients, either with a, 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 a moderate airway obstruction or obstruction that's distal to the main crina, will initially present with wheezing. And this can be problematic because it can lead to a delay in diagnosis or misdiagnosis. So I can think of a number of cases I've seen both here and in training up in Boston where we have a patient who's been treated for asthma for years and years and years, not getting better because, you know, when you hear wheezing in a healthy individual, the first thing you think about is asthma. But there are clues on the pulmonary function tests that lead to further imaging and even bronch bronchoscopic intervention. You find out they've got a carcinoid tumor that's been sitting in the airway, which is the cause of their wheezing, but has been misdiagnosed as asthma. Um, on pulmonary function tests, uh, either in this patient population or patients um, that are undergoing um, uh, uh, pulmonary toxic medications that we're getting pulmonary function tests on pre uh, prior, uh, you can see flattening of both the uh, expiratory and the inspiratory limb, depending on where the tumor is located. So a fixed obstruction in the trachea, you see flattening of the expiratory and inspiratory limbs. If there's a tumor that uh, obstructs just during exhalation um, or just during inspiration, so a variable obstruction, you can see flattening of either the inspiratory or the expiratory limbs on the pulmonary function test. So sometimes this is the first uh, way that these patients are coming um, to medical attention is that you notice something abnormal on the pulmonary function test. Um, in addition to the, the symptoms of shortness of breath and coughing, patients will pre present with hemoptysis um, because tumors eroding into the airway and bleeds or the tumor erodes into a blood vessel which is near the airway. You can get atelectasis and post-obstructive pneumonia. And post-obstructive pneumonia is one of the main reasons these patients come to attention in the hospital um, because they have a non-resolving infiltrate, a consolidation, or something which is limiting their ability to receive systemic therapy. So again, symptoms only present when you hit a literal and figurative choke point in the airway. So uh, in airway caliber, uh, trachea is typically about 14 to 18 millimeters, depending on um, whether you're a man or a woman. So uh, men have about uh, 14 to 18 millimeter airway, where women have about a, a 12 to 16 millimeter trachea. And then the main stem bronchus are in the range of about 10 to 14 millimeters, typically. Symptoms of dyspnea and exertion usually uh, present when one of those major airways, the trachea, right main stem, or left main stem bronchi, um, hit approximately eight millimeters. And then you get to a critical airway stenosis when you're less than five millimeters. That's when you usually see strider and you see shortness of breath at rest. Of the patients that are presenting to the hospital with central airway obstruction, about half to two thirds of them present with acute respiratory failure. And this is, um, um, problematic for a number of reasons, but what will typically happen with these patients is that you have a small tumor in and around the airway which is slowly growing and then something acutely happens, either a mucus plug, uh, bleeding, um, even a pneumonia which causes airway swelling which uh, narrows the luminal diameter to, again, that choke point where patients present in an emergent situation. Um, so these patients um, are walking a fine line and then all of a sudden something pushes over pushes them over the edge and it's an acute problem. Um, so the treatment principles, and we'll look at some of the different options we have for treatment, can be um, uh, broken down into a, a few different categories. But the main um, goal here is for palliation because a majority of these tumors are not gonna be in a situation where they're gonna be fully resectable, um, but your aim is to provide symptom relief and improve quality of life. Um, one of the things that we do have data for um, in this uh, patient population because, as you can imagine, it's very difficult to do randomized trials of someone who's got an airway obstruction and, and has no other options in terms of um, both symptom relief and respiratory failure, um, is that there's pretty good data that shows that if someone's intubated for malignant airway obstruction, addressing the obstruction will, um, in about three quarters to 80% of the time, liberate them from um, mechanical ventilation, which obviously is the first step in terms of initiating treatment for the underlying cause. Um, also, where goal is to prevent massive hemoptysis, so bleeding tumors in the airway continue to bleed unless they are treated and asphyxiation. And it's typically not 
asphyxiation from a slowly growing tumor, but again, that acute situation where you have a slowly growing tumor, which then hits an acute um, event, being a mucus plug, a pneumonia, which then uh, collapses the airway. And then again, to prevent or treat post-obstructive pneumonia. So uh, conditions where patients are admitted multiple times in a short period of time for recurrent pneumonia, uh, which obviously will, allow the, uh, will prevent them from getting systemic therapy. And then this is uh, an important po uh, point that we'll look at again, but when we evaluate someone for an airway obstruction, we try to track the imaging back to find out when the obstruction occurred. Uh, because after approximately six weeks to three months, you get something, you get irreversible changes to the vascularity of the lung. So if you have an obstruction in the airway, the body um, naturally or the lung naturally responds by cre uh, creating vasoconstriction to that area. So you're taking blood flow and diverting it to healthy areas of the lung. So areas that are not ventilated or not perfused after a certain period of time. And over time, those vascular changes can be permanent. So if we don't intervene on an airway obstruction um, in the first couple of months that it's identified, even after we open up the airway, we're gonna be aerating lung that's not perfused. So we're actually gonna get what's considered a pulmonary shunt or um, worsening of the patient um, um, uh, oxygenation because we're oxygenating areas that can't participate in gas exchange. When you look at the success of um, intervention on airway obstruction, the majority of um, case, uh, or the, the large majority of patients that improve after an intervention are gonna be in the central airways. So you're looking at a greater 90% success rate at tumors or obstructions that are blocking the trachea or the main stem bronchi. When you get down to the lower bronchi, you have a much uh, lower success rate. It's harder to work in the smaller airways. There's less distal tissue for you to uh, aerate and for patients to improve with. So we're, we're, our goal is to address patients um, um, when they're early on, but also when it involves a central versus a subsegmental or low bar airway. Um, so again, this is a patient uh, that we saw just last week. Um, one of the things that we look at on a CT scan like this, um, when we see that there is an obstruction in the airway, um, which in this case is the right upper lower bronchus, we look for the distal airway. So this literally is all that's left of the right upper lobe. So when we looked back and, and followed imaging over the last couple months, we identified that this obstruction had been present for a number of months. At this point, hypoxic vasoconstriction had set in, and this tissue is no longer, no longer viable. So if we were to go in and intervene on the right upper lobe, we could open this up somewhat. There's a lot of fibrotic changes in here, which would prevent it from fully expanding. We could open up the tissue. It'd be successful from a mechanical standpoint, but the patient's not going to feel any better. Actually, they transiently get more hypoxic because you're diverting airflow to lung tissue, which isn't participating in gas exchange. So that's kind of one of the main principles we look at when we see a patient in the uh, outpatient setting and more of a subacute setting um, to see if they would benefit from an airway intervention. The other things we kind of address when we're evaluating patients for an intervention, most of these are high-risk uh, procedures because you're taking someone who's already um, either immunocompromised, has a number of medical comorbidities, add on an airway obstruction, and then you put them to sleep, you paralyze them before you put a, uh, a bronchoscope in um, to do the intervention. So as you can imagine, you can take a stable patient and make them unstable very quickly. Um, just giving them sedation for a flexible bronchoscopy can reduce respiratory drive enough or uh, decrease um, ventilation enough that they um, completely uh, crump just during a diagnostic bronchoscopy. So typically when we see a patient like the one we saw before, some of the ones we'll see later on in the talk, we skip the diagnostic step and we go straight to management with a rigid bronchoscopy so we have full control of the airway. Because you never know when one of these tumors is going to start bleeding or is going to swell and then you lose an airway completely. One of the things that we can do in the middle of the night or an emergent situation is use Heliox. So this is available in, 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 in the majority of the ICUs here. Heliox will uh, increase laminar flow of, uh, of oxygen to the lung tissue. So if there, imagine a, an, an obstruction in the trachea, the airflow is kind of hitting, um, hitting the tumor and kind of circling around in the airway. You're getting some of the oxygen to the distal lung tissue, but not all of it. 
With Heliox, you narrow the stream, so it's more of a straight laminar flow, so you get more oxygen past the obstructing, uh, obstruction in the airway. So it's not a, a, a long-term solution, but it's something that we can do uh, in an emergency if the patient's unstable to, to um, undergo an intervention, if it's not ready at that point, if, if there's, uh, you know, uh, it's the middle of the night and we identify a patient who needs something done quickly. Um, so things that we look at when we say this patient is not appropriate for an airway intervention, if the lung tissue that we're looking to aerate has small airway disease, so if there's a problem distal to where the obstruction is, say there's lymphangitic carcinomatosis in the right upper lobe and there's an obstruction in the right upper lobe, opening the right upper lobe is not going to help out because the tissue that you're aerating isn't healthy. Um, same thing with um, um, distal airway disease, so if we have a large obstruction in the right main stem bronchus, but the airways in the bronchus intermedius or the right upper lobe, right lower lobe, are filled with tumor, going in and taking out the big obstruction is still not going to improve oxygenation to the distal tissue. If there's lack of perfusion to the um, involved lung, so again, the concept of hypoxic vasoconstriction, if there's no perfusion to the air of that lung, or if there's um, an obstruction, a malignant obstruction to one of the pulmonary vessels that's supplying that area of the lung, opening up the airway is going to open up a, a, a road to nowhere. It's not going to allow any oxygen to participate, any further oxygen to participate in gas exchange. And then the most important thing that I go over with our interventional fellows is that if you can't see the distal airways, you're not going to be able to um, successfully uh, open up an airway. So if you're digging around in an airway and you're pulling out a tumor and you don't know where the distal airways are, you're eventually going to lead to a worse problem. You're going to create a fistula tract. You can go into the esophagus. You can go into a big um, uh, blood vessel such as a pulmonary artery that's coming across the airway, or you can even perforate the airway, uh, leading to a pneumothorax or um, a pneumomediastinum. Um, so this is kind of the, the mantra that I get them to remember, is you've got to know where you're going when you're in the airway. If you don't know what's distal to it, you're not going to be able to get there. Um, so now going through the different type of therapies we have, for the, the different forms of airway obstruction. Uh, the most common that we use are the ablative techniques. And when we use the term ablative, it's synonymous with either debulking or debridement of, of airway lesions. Um, these can be divided into the immediate and de delayed effects. So the immediate effects, things that we can do within the next 24 hours to improve oxygenation, and then the delayed effects, which is more of a, a, you know, a subacute process, including bra bra brachytherapy and photodynamic therapy which is more of a process that will uh, debride airway lesions over weeks to months. Um, one of the coolest therapies um, we have is the laser therapy, and the one we most commonly use is the YAG laser. Um, and it's a, it's a very powerful tool. It literally, as you'll see here in just a second, it vaporizes the tumor, um, and, it's, um, and it works, um, as you can imagine, extremely quickly. It coagulates the tissue as well as, as uh, destroys it at the same time. Um, there are some other lasers that we use, the KTP CO2, that are um, much a more uh, much narrower effect um, and have a, a slower response. We have a video example here of what the the YAG looks like. We're going to skip ahead here just a little bit. So this is a tumor that's sitting on the main crino. The left main stem here is completely obstructed. Um, so the principle is we, you got to secure a good airway before you work on the obstructed airway. So um, in this video, the, they're examining the, uh, the right side. So this is the middle and the lower lobe, the right upper lobe. So all that's patent. So we know that the distal airways are patent. So we know kind of the, where we need to start working. So here's the, the laser. It's got a little aiming beam, and that's what that red light is. And then when the laser fires, you'll, lit, you'll see this tissue literally just vaporizes. And you can see there's very, very minimal bleeding when you do that. So this is considered one of the heat therapies. The immediate um, kind of ablative techniques are divided between the kind of the hot and the cold therapies. This is one of the therapies we use that relies a lot on heat. So as you can imagine, when you vaporize tissue, it's very powerful, it works very quickly, but when you get complications, they tend towards catastrophic. Um, so even though uh, complications are uncommon, 
if the laser beam misses the tumor, it doesn't abide by, well, this is normal airway, we're not gonna make a hole through it. So you can get airway perforation if the laser is not firing correctly. If there's a big blood vessel behind it, you can get massive hemorrhage. Um, you can get airway fire, so all these patients, even though they're borderline to begin with in terms of oxygenation, you have to convince the anesthesiologist to turn down the FiO2 to about 30%, um, sometimes room air, so that you don't have an airway fire. Because an airway fire is a, is a, uh, a, a, a um, complication that's extremely hard to control, um, especially when you've got a borderline patient to begin with. So patients here, you have to work in very short bursts. So you're doing 15 to 30 seconds at a time with low FiO2. Um, they tend to get hypoxic, and then you know, as a tumor slowly regresses, you've got more, oxygen, more ability to oxygenate, um, and, um, and their oxygen level comes up. So with experience, good visibility, and knowledge of airway anatomy, these complications are very minimal. This obviously is not gonna be helpful for disease that's outside the airway. This is only targeting disease in the airway. And then just kind of a side comment is because it's a laser, it can uh, damage retina for anyone who's looking at the, the fiber. So everyone has to wear protective eyewear, which kind of slows things down because it has a filter on it, everything looks green. So you're constantly taking the eyewear up and down to relook at um, kind of uh, what you've done in the airway because a lot of what we see is red, which is what's filtering out for the laser. Another type of heated therapy is endobronchial electrocautery. This is just like electrocautery they use with any surgical intervention. So this is um, a high frequency electric current which goes through a catheter which is running through the bronchoscope. At the end of it is a little metal tip which then allows for coagulation and uh, destruction of, of tissue. This is widely available. Every single operating room or endoscopy suite has the ability to do this. Um, all these tools are reusable. There are a number of different ways we can apply electrocautery. This is a cautery knife for small areas. There's a probe which covers a larger area, usually for bleeding. We'll look at an example of this here in just a second. This is a cautery snare. And then um, hot, we call them hot biopsy forceps. So these are forceps. If we have um, an undiagnosed tumor that looks like it's going to bleed, especially like um, uh, a carcinoid or even Kaposi's lesions in the airway, which tend to bleed a lot, but we've got to biopsy it. We'll use this so that we can coagulate and, and, and obtain a tissue specimen at the same time. Um, this is an example of a cautery snare. Uh, this is a patient. Here's the main crino, left main stem tumor. Um, the snare is like a lasso, so you push it out through the working channel of the bronchoscope. You kind of uh, lasso the tumor. This is one that, again, you got to look at the airway to figure out what's distal to it. When you put the camera, when we put the camera under here, and flip the tumor up, you saw it was on a little stalk. So anything that's on a little stalk, you can easily uh, lasso with the cautery snare, apply uh, coagulation as the snare closes, and then the tumor uh, comes out with uh, forcep debridement, typically. Um, again, with any heated therapy, just like the laser, there's a risk of airway fire, risk of perforation. Um, and then cautery as opposed to argon plasma coagulation, which, we use, which we'll look at in a second. And laser cautery is a contact mode. So the probe actually has to touch the tumor, has to touch the airway that you're trying to uh, coagulate, which can be a challenge because airways branch at unusual angles. So that's one of the issues with using cautery. Uh, the final heated technique is argon plasma coagulation, which is, is a really neat concept. What, um, APC does is there is a, a stream of argon gas which comes out of the catheter and then that gas serves as a medium to transmit an electrical current. So the gas comes out and goes to negatively charged surface and then um, a split second later a, uh, an ionizing current, electrical current comes through and is transmitted through the gas itself and destroys the tumor, coagulates the tumor. This is nice because this bends. It's the only technique we have which can really go around corners. So if there's a tumor in the right upper lobe, you'll never get a laser to fire directly at it. You need something like APC, which can go around a corner. Um, the other reason that we use this a lot is because it has a very superficial effect. Airway perforation is one of the things we fear a lot because it's a very difficult complication and can be catastrophic. Um, Airway, di airway uh, luminal thickness is about two to three millimeters, um, some in some areas a little bit less, but with the tumor on top of it, it's very unusual to perforate an airway using APC because this is a very superficial effect to the tumor. Um, we usually use this a lot to kind of coagulate a, a bleeding tumor before we go in and debulk it. 
Uh, this is just an example. Um, here's a, uh, the bronchoscope aiming for right upper lobe tumor and how the catheter doesn't need to come into contact with it. Um, same issues with airway perforation, even though it's less risky, it still can happen. One of the interesting things that can happen with um, APC as opposed to the other therapies is that you can get gas emboli. And we actually did a study when I was a fellow up in Boston, and we did a TEE at the same time we were doing APC, and you could actually see bubbles going across, um, uh, going across the heart and in the pulmonary arteries. And people have described um, patients who receive APC and then have an immediate gas emboli and um, run into uh, major oxygenation problems um, uh, right there in the operating room. So those were the three heated techniques. The, the cooling technique uh, that we use as well to debulk tumors is, is cryotherapy. And this can be used in two fashions. You can directly affect by freezing the tumor and allowing tissue necrosis, um, or you can freeze the tumor and remove it. And think like licking a frozen lamppost. So the tumor's the lamppost, your uh, tongue is the catheter, it sticks to it, and then you can pull it out. And we'll look at an example in just a second. But the way this works is this is a long, hollow plastic catheter. It goes through the bronchoscope. It's got a metal tip at the end. And um, uh, pressurized uh, nitrous oxide or carbon dioxide flows through, which is ultra cold. So cold gas flows through a catheter, hits a metal tip. The tip cools down within a few seconds, destroys the tissue that comes into contact by freezing it. Um, or at the very least makes contact with the tissue, and then you do cryo-excision. So you pull the tumor out attached to that frozen metal tip. Um, this can be performed with either flexible or rigid bronchoscope. Um, you cool the tip for about five seconds or so, and then you'll see here in just a second an ice ball forms. You can tell when the um, benign tissue or the uninvolved tissue starts to get um, affected by cryotherapy. So you stop it just short of that, and then you pull the tumor out. And this is a, an example. This is a patient actually with a, um, a tracheal liposarcoma. There we go. Um, so a few things to note about this. This is a very high lesion. This is just below the vocal cords. So you couldn't intubate the patient to do this. So this is someone who's spontaneously breathing under moderate sedation. So this is the cryoprobe. And you can see we're just trying to get it centered within the tumor itself to get the biggest kind of bang for our buck here, so to speak. And then here's that ice ball. So we're cooling that tip. So you can see exactly what the tissue involved is. And then everything comes out as a unit. And it just comes out like that. Um, so it's a very, very useful technique for large tumors uh, debulking. This takes, you know, in this patient, this was probably a 10 to 15 minute procedure. Um, so it's very short under moderate sedation. Um, and then the only downside is that you lose kind of visibility for a few seconds while you're bawling the tumor, taking it off the catheter, pulling the catheter out, and then quickly getting the bronchoscope back in just to make sure um, there's not um, a massive amount of bleeding. So we don't use it for renal cell tumors, typically melanomas, because those tend to bleed a lot when they're in the airway. But a, a liposarcoma is very um, uh, low risk for bleeding. Um, this is a patient that I treated a few years ago uh, with cryotherapy, and I show this because it's extremely impressive what can be done in a short period of time um, for someone who was not, um, uh, you know, heading towards surgery. But this is an 80-year-old gentleman who presented with shortness of breath and cough to an ENT clinic. Chest x-ray showed a very large mass um, with paratracheal adenopathy. So he was scheduled for an EBIS, and an EBIS is Many of you know is a way of biopsying the lymph node. So it's a, a, it's a bronchoscope with an ultrasound probe at the end. The needle goes through the airway lumen and biopsies the lymph node. So before an EBIS, we always do a flexible bronchoscope, um, mainly because visibility with the EBIS is very, is very limited. And 20 to 30% of patients with lung cancers will actually have airway involvement. So we want to identify that early on. So we, we started with a bronchoscope, so he didn't even need an EBIS because this is his right main stem bronchus. This is tumor, which was completely occluding um, the airway. Again, this is a moderate sedation patient. We weren't planning on an airway intervention. Um, so with one application of cryotherapy to the proximal end, we were able to pull out a majority of the airway obstruction. And this thing had grown so slowly and to such an extent, you can, it's a cast of his airway. So this is his middle lobe bronchus here, and these are the lower lobe bronchus. This is where it was sitting right um, above the, the right upper lobe. 
Um, and this is something that I think the pathologists did a little bit tongue in cheek, but they called this an endobronchial resection. This is not our usual biopsy specimens that they always tell us we need more tissue for. And uh, I think they did, they were having fun with it because they actually inked the margins of the proximal and the distal end. So they treated it like a, a surgical resection specimen, uh, even though it was just a cryotherapy biopsy essentially. It was five centimeters. So that comes out very quickly through the mouth and you can kind of gauge the extent of what that tumor looks like. And then this is his airway. He actually, against our advice, went golfing the next day. Um, you know, the moderate sedation procedure recovered quickly, his upper lobe and his middle and his lower lobe were visible um, distally to it. So uh, a very dramatic uh, improvement for something that probably grew over a period of months to years. That was squamous cell. Yeah, it was squamous. And he actually, uh, he declined treatment. He declined therapy. He just, he honestly, he said, I feel great. I want to go golf and never received treatment. We actually never saw him again. He just, <laughs> it was one of those very quick, I have a cough and I'm short of breath and problem is solved, you know, very functional 80 year old. Um, so even though techniques like that can be done with the flexible bronchoscope, um, we, t we tend to, because of risk of bleeding and other unanticipated consequences, do most of these with a rigid bronchoscope. Uh, most of our therapeutic interventions. The reason for that, a rigid bronchoscope, and we'll look at, uh, look at it in here in just a second, long hollow metal tube that we use both for intervention, so we can use it to cut tumors out, debulk tumors out, to dilate airways, but it also allows us to ventilate. So you've got um, a ventilating um, a bronchoscope, essentially. The large diameter, we use uh, equivalent to about 11 uh, ET tube, anywhere from, depending on the airway size and what we're intervening on, any, the smallest rigid bronchoscope we use is eight millimeters, um, and that's, pediatric size, so to speak. So we go all the way up to 13 millimeters. So those are pretty big uh, endotracheal tubes, uh, as you can imagine. But that allows us to protect the airway, suction blood out, we can ventilate, and it allows us to put in a variety of different stents. Um, my, uh, my mentor up in Boston always consented patients and said what we're doing is a medical equivalent of sword swallowing, um, because as you will see, these are very large hollow metal tubes. Um, and it's uncomfortable, um, so they all require general anesthesia. Having said that, before the flexible bronchoscope was in, invented about 50 years or so, all bronchoscopies were done with patients wide awake using a rigid bronchoscope. So it is possible to do it, it's just not recommended. Um, and then um, a majority of pulmonologists don't perform rigid bronchoscopes, less than 5%, and almost all of those are, um, have gone through interventional pulmonary training. Um, this is what a rigid bronchoscope looks like. So they're color coded in terms of size. They're long enough that you can put it in a main stem bronchus and these holes are ventilating ports. So if I have the bronchoscope sitting in the right main stem bronchus, I can still ventilate the left lung. So we're uh, isolating essentially um, uh, ventilation. Uh, it's, it's inserted like a Miller blade, a Miller um, um, uh, um, uh, blade for intubation. So it's kind of a straight uh, approach to the airway. So you start off at a 90 degree angle, find the uvula, elevate the epiglottis. Once you see the vocal cords, you rotate the scope because it is a cutting edge. It is pretty sharp and, and, and advance it through the, the vocal cords. Um, so this is a very short video. And the reason it's short is you can imagine these are patients with an airway obstruction, a lot of comorbid illness. They're borderline to begin with. And then you convince an anesthesiologist to sedate them and paralyze them not knowing when you're gonna have an airway. So we, we tend to go pretty quickly um, when we're intubating these patients. Um, so this is the rigid bronchoscope. There's a telescope that can move independent, uh, but then again, there, there's the uvula, here's the epiglottis. Um, this is at an angle, so this is actually a sh very sharp edge, so it's gonna rotate as it goes through the vocal cords so we don't shear the vocal cords. And then there is that diseased airway. And you can see as soon as the scope goes in, sometimes you just give a breath because those patients are you know, um, tenuous to begin with. So again, the, the rigid bronchoscope is a ventilating tool. Um, the tool part is, can be used for mechanical debridement or to break open strictures. Um, this is the core out technique, so we use this for very large tumors, like something like this um, that's blocking the right main stem bronchus. 
Um, the, the rigid bronchoscope has a beveled edge so that if you use it at the right angle, it can cut the tumor off the airway. Um, it also can, if, if you don't know what's distal to this and you start cutting, you may have some abnormalities in the airway and go instead of in the airway, through the airway. Um, so again, you know, I, I emphasize to the fellows, you gotta know where you're going. Um, but the way this technique works is you just kind of in a corkscrew fashion, core the tumor off the airway, you know, and, and, and then you suction it out or use a forcep and pull it out or you freeze and pull it out. So pretty big specimens can be removed that way. Fortunately, we haven't had catastrophes. We tend to, yeah, exactly. Um, we, we tend to be very cautious, even though we have to be somewhat aggressive. Um, I have seen major bleeds. I have seen major hemoptysis. If we have tumors that we, that we know are in locations, the left upper lobe especially, um, they tend, when you biopsy them, even small biopsies, they tend to massively hemorrhage um, if there's a vessel feeding it. Um, what we've learned with experience is that we have a balloon ready. Um, so we'll take a balloon, we'll do the biopsy. If I see bleeding, the scope is already in the left main stem bronchus, so all we do is we take a balloon and we inflate it. And you leave it inflated for five minutes. And bleeding typically stops as long as they're not coagulopathic. Um, that's the major thing we've seen. I've seen airway dehiscence. I've, you know, I've put in stents that erode through the airway and you get huge cavities in the mediastinum. Those are antibiotics, typically non-surgical. Um, sometimes we do have the thoracic surgeons come in and repair those, depending on where they're located. You can put a stint over, depending on where it is. If, if you're in a right main stem bronchus and you perforate going towards the main crina, I can stint over that. If I perforate a small airway, I don't have stints small enough to go into those. So you, um, you either put an endobronchial blocker up, or more, more likely than not, you just leave it as a contained perf. Uh, most of those times, they don't progress, but they do get infected. You're taking, you know, I've seen, uh, I've seen in some patients that other, you know, um, fortunately not myself, but other people have intervened on. I've seen pericardium when we go in through the bronchus. Uh, I have an image of a patient who had a right upper lobe tumor, which eroded into the proximal right main stem, and they, uh, we got called at 3 in the morning because he coughed up 500 cc's of blood and then it stopped. And those are things that you can't wait to the morning. We go in, we intubate him, and you see the pulmonary artery pulse, pulsing in, in and out of the airway just because the tumor had eroded both through the airway and into the pulmonary artery. You know, in a situation like that, there's, there's absolutely nothing you can do. Um, my, my attending at that point told me, he said, I'm sorry to say this, but it's a terminal hospitalization. You know, there's just really nothing you can do when you see the pulmonary artery bleeding into, um, in, into the airway. Um, if it's a smaller vessel, you send them from bronchial artery embolization and you temporize it. Um, but yeah, this is unfortunately kind of the risks we do and uh, we take, and that's why we have to be careful with patient selection. So even though we can aerate you know, most lung tissue if there's an obstruction, we have to make sure it's worth the risk in many cases. Um, so moving on um, from the immediate kind of um, uh, interventions, ablative techniques, and debulking to more of the subacute or chronic ways to treat airway obstruction, um, uh, photodynamic therapy has been very helpful for a lot of the tumors, especially the vascular tumors, the, uh, the renal cells that go to the airway, um, the melanomas. Melanomas respond to this very, very well, and that's just because they're very vascular tumors which take up the photofrin. So the way PDT works, it's a systemically injected um, chemotherapeutic agent, photofrin, which then is activated at a certain um, wavelength of light. So you get local activation of chemotherapy, so targeted apoptosis. Um, the downside, and we'll look at an example here in just a second, the downside of this is that because it's systemically injected and it's photosensitive, patients are light sensitive for about a month at a time. So think about like the invisible man outfit. That's what they literally have to wear for about a month. Wide brimmed hat to protect the face from sunburns, um, dark rimmed glasses because you can get retinal uh, burns as well from this. You can be very, very photosensitive. Um, some patients, fair skin patients, can go up to two months in terms of how long they're photosensitive. Other patients I've seen after two weeks, they can start taking off the long sleeve shirts and wearing shorts again without risk of sunburns. This is not a popular technique in July or August in Atlanta. This is something that we could do year round in Boston, but here in Atlanta, patients obviously don't want to walk around in an overcoat 
uh, in the middle of July. Um, the other downside is this isn't just sunlight, this is ambient light. Like even these fluorescent lights here have wavelengths of 420, which is what Photofrin is activated at. So they can get sunburns just sitting indoors with ambient light. Um, the downside to this is because it's not an immediate effect. Patients can sometimes get worse before they get better. You get swelling of the airway with the um, targeted chemotherapy, so they swell, they can lose an airway before they recannulize it. <clears throat> this is kind of a week in the life of someone who's getting photodynamic therapy. So on a Monday, they come into the infusion center, they get uh, uh, an injection of photofrin. On Wednesday, so after 48 hours of it being absorbed, we go in with a bronchoscope. This is a non-thermal laser, so a laser set at about 420 to 440 nanometers, activate the, the, the photofrin locally, and then it takes about 48 to 72 hours. So either that Friday or the final or the next Monday, we go in and we just debride out necrotic tissue. And this works very, very well. We'll look at an example here in just a second. But as you can imagine, tumors that are more vascular take up more of the photofrin and get better tumor necrosis. Um, these tumors don't bleed. You know, you try to debride a renal cell without PDT, and those bleed quite a bit when they're in the airway and can um, actually lead to um, a lot of blood clots, even post-procedure, that can cause um, airway obstruction. Um, this is a patient uh, that we saw a few years ago, 76-year-old with metastatic melanoma, uh, had a very large crinal met, which was obstructing both the right and the left at intermittently at different times. The right side was easier to address, but the left side underwent two rigid bronchoscopes by uh, thoracic surgery outside of Emory, a surgeon outside of Emory, which um, told the patient, I can't do anything more, the tumor keeps coming back. Um, as you know, most of these melanomas are not responsive uh, to radiation therapy, so had failed that option. And then uh, was not a candidate for systemic therapy, and you can see why. There's just complete white out of the left lung. Um, you could tell there's no effusion here because the tracheal uh, shadow is pulled it so laterally. So this is all just collapsed lung. And bronchoscopically, this is what it looks like. This is main crina. So the right side, at least at this time, is, is patent. Um, the airway itself is this little dot right up here. So this is all tumor coming through the crina. It's a mixed obstruction. You see some tumor in the airway with a lot of extrinsic compression. So she underwent photodynamic therapy. Again, this swells first. So this gets worse before it gets better. Um, but this is what it looked like when we were done. And um, just an excellent result. This actually persisted for a year or two after. She really had a great response. Now, it's not just the photofrin. She was able to tolerate systemic therapy at this point. Um, but this is her left main bronchus before and after. Another one of those uh, delayed uh, effect ablative techniques that we use is brachytherapy. Um, these these kind of come in waves uh, in terms of patients that get treated. But essentially, the way that we do this is we use the bronchoscope to deliver a hollow catheter um, through the nose. We secure the catheter at the nose, put the bronchoscope next to the catheter, and then put a dummy, uh, a dummy catheter through, um, which has little radiopaque markings on it. And then we measure along the radiopaque markings where the tumor is. Catheter is secured, they wake up, go to radiation therapy, and then the brachytherapy seeds are applied. And this is a patient we treated recently. These are those little markings, and then this is the planning for the, the, the radiation therapy. Um, people have described this in early stage disease or carcinoma in situ as, uh, as curative. Um, this, is, uh, this is one of those patients that if it weren't my own patient, I'd look at it and say this has to be made up. There's no way that a patient could have a response like this, but some people just have better responses than you can imagine. I'm sure we've all seen that. But this is an 80-year-old gentleman with uh, end-stage COPD, he's oxygen dependent. This is a tumor, a squamous cell in his right main stem bronchus which, you know, for multiple reasons, low FEV1, comorbid illness, and then just the mechanics of getting this out, this was not a uh, surgical candidate. So um, Dr. Stapleford and I treated this patient over at Midtown um, a couple years back with brachytherapy. Um, this is kind of what that dummy catheter is, not this patient in particular, but those are those markings in the catheter. So once that uh, hollow catheter is placed, we put the um, the dummy catheter through, and then on the bronchoscope, I measure this point and then proximal a little bit, and then they um, use those markings to deliver the radiation seed. This was him six months out. Um, he just had a 
a, essentially a complete response. We bronked him multiple times because Liza and I couldn't believe that this tumor didn't come back. It, it never did. Um, he, um, he unfortunately succumbed to his end stage COPD, but um, it had an excellent response. This could easily have obstructed the airway and caused more problems, but um, it was a very good response to brachytherapy. Um, so we've talked mainly about endoluminal disease and mixed disease. Just a few minutes I wanted to spend on what we do for extrinsic compression. Um, uh, two techniques, typically bronchio, uh, bron um, sorry, bronchoplasty or balloon dilation of the airway is helpful. Most of the strictures recur, so we have to consider placing stents. Uh, this is a patient with a stricture in the, in the proximal trachea. We do these with rigid bronchoscopes, typically because you occlude the airway. We have to inflate that balloon for about a minute, if not longer. So you completely lose the airway, especially in a tracheal lesion when the balloon is inflated. And then it, it works in the acute setting, but this tends to recur. Most airway strictures tend to recur. Um, this is a patient with a uh, left lower lobe um, stricture after radiation therapy. Um, a young patient with stage 3B was treated here. This is a left lower lobe. Uh, presented with collapse on a CT scan. And this is kind of the sequence. So for something like that, we had to make a cut using a cautery knife. And you know you're in the right airway because you start getting mucus out. And mucus can be pretty thick and pretty extensive. And here is it just being sucked out of the left lower lobe. Um, and then the balloon goes in. Um, and then, again, going back to the concept of hypoxic vasoconstriction, sometimes you have to wait a minute or two when this airway turns from white to pink so that you know there's blood flow, but eventually this is all the subsegments of the left lower lobes and they, they look fairly healthy. Um, so this was someone who hadn't been collapsed for a long enough period of time where that hypoxic vasoconstriction sets in. So in an airway like that, in a lobar bronchus, we don't have stents that are small enough that we can put in, but in the larger airways, in the trachea, right and left main stem bronchus, stents are an option. Um, so we use stents for both the intrinsic and extrinsic compression. Uh, we use them to cover fistulas if they develop either from the malignancy or from prior procedures, and then to prevent reoccurrence of strictures. We do a lot of stenting for benign airway disease as well, especially in the lung transplant patients. Uh, the, again, the best place to put stents in are the main airways, trachea, right, left main stem bronchi. These are not good targets. These are good targets for ablative therapy, PDT, radiation therapy, but the lobar bronchi, right upper, middle, lower lobe, left lower, left upper lobe, they're not good targets because we don't really have stints that um, will, confine, will be confined to the airway. Um, a variety of stints, the most common we use for malignant disease is a self-expanding metal stint, which is wrapped up along a catheter and you undo the, um, the string and the, and the stint opens up. These are able to be molded into just about any shape of the airway. They're very helpful. They're very difficult to remove, so when we put them in, um, especially in malignant disease, we assume they're going to be in, in for life because what happens is the tumor grows through these little um, uh, kind of uh, holes in the stent and it holds onto it. So when you pull it out, it comes out in piecemeal and can be a real problem to remove them. So when we make a decision to put a metal stent in, we just assume it's going to be in for life. Silicone stents are fully removable. These are a little bit more difficult to place. They are um, harder to mold into a turn in an airway. And then this is a hybrid stent, which is um, very helpful sometimes for um, a fistula or for a airway that you need to cover. It's a polyurethane backbone, but it has the properties of nitinol, which is this uh, self-expanding metal. Um, so it can actually be folded down. And then when you un un unsheath it and it opens up, it takes about 72, to 72 hours to so about a week for it to come to body temperature, and it will expand over that period of time. That's one of the properties of nitinol of this metal is that when it's cold, it shrinks, and then when you heat it up, it expands even after you put the stent in place. Um, so they, they, you actually can increase the diameter over time. Um, this is a, a gentleman that um, required a stent for a very central airway obstruction. He hadn't received radiation therapy, and as you can imagine, we were concerned that he was going to lose his, ther his airway with therapy. Um, so this is what his bronchoscopic image looked like. So we call these keyhole-shaped airways. Normal anterior posterior diameter, but the lateral diameter is very narrowed. A stent and then a balloon. And again, this stent isn't at body temperature yet, so it takes some time to open up completely. So in a situation like this that we have to get it opened up right away, we balloon it open. 
Um, and then this is what the airway looks like after the stent. Again, it's going to continue to open up in the lateral diameter, but at least you can see the main crine on the right and the left. And that's kind of what it looks like in the, the CT image afterwards. Um, this, is a, this is an interesting case um, that we treated here not that long ago. This is a patient who was admitted to an outside hospital, had a um, right main stem obstruction, um, had been intubated and I don't know why, but they decided to, it was better to extubate this unstable airway before transfer. Um, this is what the chest x-ray looked like. Um, they did brush the tumor. This is the tumor, and you'll see the endoscopic view in just a second. So here's the trachea. It's coming into the trachea here. This little dot right here is what's left of the right main stem bronchus. But when you go further down on the image, and you can see the bronchus intermedius is open. So again, the concept of knowing what's distal, where your airway is leading, is very important in a situation like this. So this is a bronchoscopic image. So this is that trachea, that tumor coming through the trachea. Here's the left side. You can't even see the right side of the airway. So when we put the scope in like this, this is what you say. I've, I've got to have a seat. Like This is what it feels like, because you never know what's going to happen here. Um, but we did some debridement, we cored out the tumor, used a lot of APC because this was a very vascular tumor, and then we placed a Y stent. So Y is a tracheal limb, right main stem, left main stem limb. This is what it looked like after we were done. So here's a tracheal limb. You can see distally the right and the left. Here's the right side, the left side. So we knew if we could get into the bronchus intermediates, you can open it up. Um, and then that's a picture of the, the left side. Now this is... Um, what frequently happens with a lot of our patients, they wake up and they feel great. This gentleman was not shy about admitting that he was about to be discharged and go home and smoke again. Um, he said he felt like he'd never smoked a cigarette a day in his life, which meant after he was discharged, he was going to go home and smoke again. Um, but he did get radiation therapy, so the tumor shrank, and then with these silicone stents, they're easily removed. You just take them out afterwards, and um, his airway remained patent. Um, but this, again, immediate um, uh, ablative technique leading to long-term therapy. Um, in the last couple minutes here, I, I just wanted to show that even though we don't have a lot of data, it's very difficult to do randomized trials for these patients with airway obstruction, there is some data that the interventions we just talked about are effective. So um, in a large series, about 2,000 patients, a number of years ago, patients who had malignant airway obstruction, about 75% of them uh, improved quality of life scores, coughing, hemoptysis. With stent placement in a smaller series, about 50 patients, there's immediate relief of shortness of breath, which is very rewarding when patients wake up and, like that gentleman said, I feel like I've never smoked. It's just a very dramatic improvement. Um, this is a smaller study with using debridement, using laser, and a stent placement. About 82% of patients had you know, in this patient population with limited um, lung function, a third of a liter actually can make a pretty big difference, but they've had an increase in the FEV in about 30%. And then again, this is what I alluded to earlier, is that this is the main data that we, um, uh, that we kind of cite whenever we see a patient who has an advanced malignancy but is on the ventilator from that malignancy is that up to 88% of these patients can be liberated from mechanical ventilation if the reason they're on the ventilator is from a malignant airway obstruction. So going and intervening, placing a stent, doing a laser, we can get patients off the ventilator. And it's, it's very challenging sometimes to convince the anesthesiologist that we're taking an ICU patient who's intubated, doing a procedure, putting a stent in, and then telling them don't put the ET tube back in because that's going to dislodge the stent. You know, So we need to wake them up even though they've been intubated and potentially paralyzed in the ICU for a day or so, wake them up because they now have a paid in airway. Um, this is the kind of flip side of that coin is that, again, these interventions are tending to palliation. So a lot of these patients have limited survival. But um, a patient who's intubated on a ventilator happened acutely, at least can go home, and if they have four months, um, they can spend that time with family. So again, it's quality of life. Um, this is a database that was recently published, about 1,000 um, uh, patients, and I, I, I just pointed out because the overall complication rate tends to be pretty low, about 4%. Mortality is less than 1% for all the interventions that we just talked about. Um, so kind of in summary here, uh, what we looked at today is malignant airway obstruction can occur with any form of cancer, and in lung cancer specifically, it can occur up to 30% of the time. 
There are three different types. There's the intrinsic, the endoluminal disease, extrinsic, and then the most common form, the mixed obstruction. We looked at some of the debridement techniques we have, the laser, the APC, and then cautery for the hot therapy, cryotherapy, and then the delayed response with photodynamic therapy and, and brachytherapy, and looked at a few examples of patients that we dilated and stinted. Um, so just in summary, kind of the take home message is these are palliative techniques, um, improves, the data shows that improves symptom relief, quality of life, um, and relief of post-obstructive infection and, and, and liberation from the ventilator. Um, but unfortunately, none of our techniques have been shown to prolong sur survival, but I don't think we're ever going to have that data just for, for obvious reasons that it's difficult to perform those randomized trials. Um, so I thank everyone for their attention, and I'll, I'll hang around here in case there are any questions. Thank you.